first of all, um, there's a lot to unpack because I could take this in a bunch of different ways. So the, the actual underlying question is how do you renegotiate with the seller? Yeah, based fundamentally, yeah. Okay. So what's your best practices in going about facilitating that conversation successfully? But I don't, let's, let's write down, we need to talk about your buyers and how to approach them on specific deals. Yeah, on the back end. And I think part of that is re reflecting on one, really auditing the quality of buyer pool that I have in my buyer's list and making sure that this is a list of people worth sending deals to. They're not a bunch of, the more deals I send and the more radio signs I get, I'm finding there's just more and more on the fence newbies that are on this list and maybe aren't the type of buyers that you're, you know, when you send them an opportunity, they're genuinely going to entertain it, right? Yep. Or, or try, they're not just like, oh, well, give me on your mailer. And then every time you send them something, they're like, oh, I'm not ready right now. I'm not ready. You yeah. Know what I mean? yeah. Yeah, so let's talk about that in a second. But so one of the ways, the best way to kind of go back to a seller is first of all, you need to start by leaving it hanging when you contract the deal, right? If you give over certainty, oh, I got this, I'm gonna close at this price, this is great, done deal, and then you don't wholesale it, then you're gonna really be climbing uphill. So I'm always leaving the, hey, um, my money guy approved it. Um, here's what ultimately happens. We have kind of a, you know, cross check verification all the way through the process. I have a money partner and I have a contractor partner. And, and while the contractor partner believes he's going to be able to get this done, he didn't have, you know, everything he needed to green light the con construction bit here. So money guys, good. We're good here. Um, but I'm going to need my team and, you know, several people probably to have to go through this and, and to figure out if we're on budget based around the budget I gave him in the budget that he confirmed without walking the property. Fair enough, Mr. Seller, great. Great, let's contract this, but just be aware, um, I still have to work with my contractor to make sure that we're, we stay on budget. Okay. So I leave that like cliffhanger because ultimately when you go back, you're gonna have to blame the construction side. Yeah. Right? And so this works really well for everything except for like new homes. Like if you were going in and buying a 2014 home. Yeah really hard to get away with that one right yeah, um, yeah, yeah and so now i have this out every time now you have an out to back out of the deal hey i couldn't you know based around you know everything i've seen and whatever whatever we can't move forward but you also have an out to renegotiate and you say hey mr seller um man my construction guy regardless of whether he's seen it or not just took on a property right down the road from you guys and we went over budget big and it was a very similar home, blah, 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 blah. Um, he is uncomfortable at this scope of work and it's, it's out of budget. And now my money guy is basically saying, well, if we're out of budget, then we can't move forward. Can we sharpen our pencils here? Like I'm close, but we went so far out of budget that he just is not confident that we're gonna hit the budget that I gave him. Um, you know, I know we agreed at 200, where can we be? I mean, is there any room at all? And that, by the way, Mr. Seller, it's okay if there's not. Um, it was out of my control. Ultimately, I'm not the end-all, be-all decision maker. It really comes down to my construction team and my money partner to have confidence to do it. They don't right now. So if this is not going to work for you, all good. We don't have to move forward. But if it can work for you, you know, where can we be? You know, and then I shut up right after I say that. But let me tell you the psychology of why I framed it this way. I don't want the pressure on them. So I'm playing indifferent. I call it a boomerang effect, right? Like, hey, it's okay if, I, if we can't move forward. If you need that 200 and that's where you need to be, it's all good. I'm not the right buyer for you. I couldn't get there. It's gonna take a lot more work. So I'm so, super sorry and kind of going negative. I'm so sorry, I'm the bad guy, me, 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 right? But also like, I'm just not the right buyer. Yeah. The psychology of you pushing them away, and I know you're married and all that, but the same thing when you're dating. Like, when you're indifferent with girls, they seem to want you. It's the same reason why, like, my wife jokes around all the time. She's like, oh, now that you're married, you're going to get even more girls, right? I'm like, why do you mean? Because girls love married guys, right? Like, they're unattainable, they're safe, they're whatever, and then they don't want the single girl. Right. So when the single girl can, can't have it, they want it. Same idea, right? Yeah. Like when you aren't the right buyer for their home they homeowners almost get defensive like what do you mean my home is great yeah you got to do a rehab but like why don't you want it so they almost want to come at you more well can you get to 190 
can you get to 195? And you, they'll start negotiating against themselves. So that's the psychology is playing on indifference and using a boomerang effect that, which I just created as a name because the harder you throw a boomerang, the faster it comes back, right? And so- You, um, you, better, you better trademark that shit right now. <laughs> better dog. I already have sales trainers like John and, and Steve Trang and, and just people yeah. that are like using the terms. So, yeah. which yeah. is- I don't So know. I, like, I like that because um, it doesn't, it, you're not giving them an ultimatum. You're not, you're not saying like, listen, we can't make this deal. So we don't want it anymore. It's more, you're more so saying like, I'm going to give you, you know, we're good either way, but it, the decision's on you rather than us come to you and say, Hey seller, this deal's dead. We can't deal with it. Right. We, we can't make it work or whatever. It's, yeah. You know. I give them the, I give them the ball again. And by the way, by me giving them the ball again, what am I doing? I'm keeping control of the conversation. Right. When I give someone control, that means I'm really in control. Follow me? Follow so me. when you do that and you have to go back to them and then the key, like always, is just be quiet once you say that. Hey, I might not be the right buyer for you. That's totally okay. It's ultimately the decision is going to be around the construction crew, making sure my money partner feels good about them the all money in. And I like using that, my contractor, like kind of out. It, it allows you to play a little good cop, bad cop to a degree. Like as you as the face-to-face -face person, you're like, you know, hey, you know, I re you know, if I'm really trying to make this work, I, I want the DI person, but unfortunately, there's other components in this approval. Amen, bro. And that's that's literally how you. But that framing should really be throughout all conversations. It's really, you know, hey, I think we're good at 200. Just to let you know, um, you know, I have a money guy. I have one of those guys that exactly what you think. You know, small little glasses in the back room. He approves everything in and out. Ultimately, all is his call on whether he feels comfortable but how he feels comfortable is based around the bid i give him in our contracting partner agreeing with that bid that that we're in the right ballpark and so really it's kind of like yeah i can make the decision but these guys are really kind of pulling the real string so we just need to make sure i wasn't too far off i don't think i am i'm usually not you know and so we'll be able to move forward in that 14 days and we'll go from there but now i've layered that in already so now when I go back, hey, remember I was telling you about this contracting partner? Well, shoot, we just did a property right down the street from you guys, same square footage. We just went way over budget. There was just so much unforeseen stuff that we didn't account for. Um, he does not feel comfortable at the budget I gave him anymore. Now it's not crazy. It's not like it's a double the budget, but it's enough that it scared off my money partner to say he's not comfortable. So. With that said, I might not be the right buyer for you. I'm totally sorry about that. I feel awful. Uh, I always try to do good business and, and help out. Um, and you know, if I'm not the right buyer, that's okay. It's totally okay. It's my fault. I'm so sorry. I feel awful. Um, where would you like to take the conversation? Yeah, and then put it on them. And I have to shut up at that moment. And I literally just wait. And there's times where a seller said, well, all right, we're done here. That's it. You pissed me off. Like. Okay, and then I try to let him cool off and come back to it and all that kind of other stuff. Um, and then there's other times where they just immediately start negotiating against themselves. Yeah, and in an effort to keep it alive. That's right, because they're already they're already bought into selling. They're like contracted it, it's done. Their psychology is like, oh, I'm moving out March 20th, right? And so now they start to negotiate. Well, I mean, a couple grand maybe, like 195. Uh, 195 like you know like I said it was a pretty big oversight on this last deal down the street I don't think that's gonna fly I, and maybe I'm just not the right buyer I think that's okay I just I feel bad but I think it's got to be more than just a 5,000 and maybe you can't do that and you know that's okay if you can't and it's my fault I'm sorry mm -hmm. and then be quiet again I didn't renegotiate yet I didn't give them a number yet yeah then they might say something into the effect. Well, where do you need to be? And then if you kind of know, but this is, so let's go back to the buyer now. Now, when you are getting crickets or you're getting buyers that say, based around that budget, I can, like get a number out of them. Yeah. Every time. So one thing I'll do, if I'm uncertain about a property and where someone, like I did this yesterday on a deal, um, it was a newer home. And because it didn't need a big old rehab, you kind of like, shoot, where would someone pay for this, right? Um, so we pinged a couple buyers, literally three, and we said, Hey, where would you 
be on this property, right? And uh, they all gave us a number. I'd bite at this. And now I know how to either renegotiate, specifically yesterday was negotiate, but now I know how to renegotiate or not. And so I leverage kind of going back to this buyers, you really need to have a good buyers group. Like I have roughly, a, a, well, it's 110 on the list, but there's 47 people that buy from me consistently in Phoenix. I will ping a handful of them anytime that I'm, ugh, where does yes, this be? Yeah. And, and before I negotiate, before I even get in the negotiation with the seller, I'm like, hey dude, where would you need to be on this? Yeah. I'm like, and then I use, I'm negotiating with them. They're tough. It's a hard negotiation. I'm trying to get to a reasonable number. Where would you need to be? And then they'll say, hey, if you can get it at, you know, 180, I'm in. So I know there's always a little, that's their perfect world. So right. if I go back to them and say, hey, can you get to 190? Yeah. Most times they'll be like, yeah, I could do 190. Because yeah. they want it at 180, right? Yeah. But they'll take so I do that a lot. I mean, a lot. And that's kind of goes back to even what we talked about before, like my sphere of influence. Like, you know why I sell so many freaking deals? It's because I'm so good with people. I'm so good with my buyers. Yeah. Yeah. I shop for them essentially. Like, right. yeah, yeah, I'm I negotiating the deal, but then I go and say, hey, what do you want it for? Let me go try to get it for you at that number. Right. Which is a great way to do it. And that's, and so one thing I'm over the next 60 days that I need to really put an emphasis, emphasis on is, ex, is not, not expanding necessarily in a volume standpoint, but expanding in a depth of quality standpoint. My buyers are so that I can have those five, six, seven, eight guys or whatever that I know I can ping with any deal. And they're going to be, they're, they're looking for an opportunity. They're looking for the next, right? Um, because like I told you, the buyers that I have right now, is, there's maybe three guys on there that are that way. And that's not a deep enough buyer's pool to like, to know you have somebody, a, a, a locked in buyer every single time. And unfortunately the fall off between that first tier and the rest of it is there's just, they're all a bunch of radio sounds. And so the, the more I kind of monitor and audit that, I, I'm just realizing how many of these guys were just like, you know, the guys in the local investor Facebook page, like, oh, I'd love to yeah. be on your wholesale list. And then they, they buy one house a year, maybe. No, you, know, but they're you just have a better, you gotta keep working on your buyers list, dude.